All right. All right, let's pull together, everyone. There'll be a few late stragglers coming in. The coffee line got a little bit too long. Um, what we're going to see here in uh, Saul uh, in the early phase, uh, Saul, as we know, is not going to be the king who the Lord chooses. So we're expecting you know, subpar performance from this king. We would anticipate that. And even Samuel, we have in chapter 10, let's look over at verse 17, the public ceremony uh, where we have Saul choosing uh, the king here and uh, validating him as king before the people. So let's hear from the words of uh, uh, Samuel here, beginning in chapter 17. I'm going to ask uh, our brother Charles to read from somewhere in the world. You're saying uh, chapter 10, starting at verse 17, right? Yeah, and down through verse 26. Okay, sir. Therefore Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. The sons of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel up from Egypt, and I delivered you from the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. If you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses, yet you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your people. Thus Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by lot. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the tribe family was taken, and Saul the son of Kish but when they looked for him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? So they said, Behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. And took, and took him from there. When he stood among the people. He was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Samuel said, all, said to all the people, Did you see him whom the Lord has chosen? No one like him among all the people. He shouted and said, Long live the king. Samuel told the people, The ordinances of the kingdom, and he wrote them in a book and placed it before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his own house. Saul also went to his house at Gibeah, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. Okay, thanks, uh, Charles. So what we see here is uh, this uh, reminder. We see some echoes of what Samuel had said earlier, back in 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is the kind. You've rejected your God who delivers you from all your calamities. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Remember, I brought Israel up from Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians. That's, that's the first level subhead title of the Ten Commandments. I am Yahweh, the God who brought you up from the land of, of Egypt. This is the Lord who, this is the king who you're rejecting, verse 19. So it's theologically, you know, there's some interesting things that Samuel brings into this affirmation of Saul as king. We see a little uh, sarcasm here, down here, uh, with where Saul to be found. Well, he's hiding himself by the baggage. They have to go find him, which is going to be uh, reminiscent of Saul when we get to the battle or the conflict with Goliath. Who's on the battlefield? Who's hanging behind? Who's running out to the battlefield? We're going to see. So there's some things that are going on with the contrast. We saw earlier in verse 23, the author here reminds us that, yeah, well, he's taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel says to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? Kind of a, kind of a little bit of sarcasm there. Where, where is this king to be seen? He's tall. Why can't you see him? <laughs> where is he? You know. So there's a little bit of play on, on words there, I think. Surely there's no one like him from all the people. Samuel might be... Uh, showing a little sarcasm there. Um, all right. Well, so we move on to uh, chapter 11, and there's a couple things we want to see here. Um, so Saul is going to experience early military success here against the Ammonites. Let's uh, read this in chapter 11, verses 11 through uh, 
15. Let's go over to, uh, let's see, Daniel, are you here today? There you are. Let's have you read in uh, 1 Samuel 11, 11 through 15. The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until he until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that shall Saul bring over us? Turn these men over to us, so that we may put them to death. But Saul said, no one will be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Okay, so they rejoiced greatly, they're excited, there's military victory Saul brought about, and hey, here he's getting off to this great start as king. Even theologically, Saul says in verse 13, for today Yahweh has accomplished deliverance in Israel. It seems like, wow, maybe this is the Deuteronomy 17 king. You know, maybe we will see the kind of king that Israel needs show up. Um, but then we hear from Samuel again, and Samuel's going to, in chapter 12, is going to interrupt this speech uh, and this uh, rejoicing. He's, after a brief uh, testimonial and historic review, we see that Samuel gets right to the point. So in 1 Samuel chapter 12, look over here in verses 12 through uh, 18. Um, let's see. Could I have uh, Brad? Where are you? Brad, Brad, Brad. There you are, right next to him. Okay. Let's have you read in uh, yeah, 12 through 18. Right. He saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you. He said to me, No way a king shall reign over us when the Lord, when the Lord, the God, is your king. And now behold the king whom you, have, who you, whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and that both of you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, or rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Yeah, let's pause there. So it's interesting where this comes in. Samuel, in his speech, he's now speaking again. Like He sounds a lot like Moses. Sounds a lot like Moses here. Um, well, you know, you've got a king. Uh, but the fork in the road is remaining the same. It's always about how you will respond to the Lord and his commands. And he says, if you proceed in the right way, king and nation, right? He says, fearing the Lord, verse 14, hearing, listening to his voice, not rebelling against the commands, the instructions of the Lord, both you and also your king who reigns over you, if you follow the Lord, you know, what's going to happen? Good things, the blessings. But if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, verse 15, but rebel, then the hand of the Lord will be against you. So, you know, Samuel reiterates, well, if this is kind of a crack. Maybe, you know, Samuel's thinking this thing may have a chance to go in the right direction. But it's going to have to involve both king and nation in, in alignment with uh, this, uh, this uh, response, this faithful response and obedience. So in verse 18, uh, Samuel calls to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Kind of a little bit of an echo there. It kind of reminds me of uh, Exodus 19 and 20 at Mount Sinai. When the Lord shows up, and uh, you know, you know, Moses represents the Lord in his authority, bringing the Ten Commandments down, but the Lord's presence is there at Mount Sinai, the thunder and the lightning, the sound of trumpets, and all of the things that we remind ourselves from uh, Exodus 19 and 20. So there's a little bit of authentication here that we see coming from the Lord. The Lord shows up and he, you know, sends a little spark. And uh, we have hopes of a, of a, you know, and then the 19. And all the people say to Samuel in verse 19, 
Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Is this going to be repentance? And Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have committed all this evil. Yet, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And we keep going back to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? It's a singularity of heart. And so this is good. We're seeing a little bit of a renewal. This call for the singularity of allegiance to one king is coming from Samuel and hopefully from the people. Verse 21, do not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, reputation, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Boy, this is really refreshing. It goes all the way back to the uh, initial formative years uh, where the Lord chooses his people. They're young. They're just a child out of Egypt and all of the, all of the things that were declared. And then finally, in verse 24, Samuel calls for a, a heart with feet, this idea of a heart with feet. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. So it's my famous picture we always come back to. You'll see it showing up in a lot of different places, but the picture of authentic faith, you see Moses, and in this case Samuel, like Moses, is speaking for the faith and the obedience. The combination of faith and obedience equals what is true with regards to a heart that's authentic before the Lord in the covenant relationship. All right, so we move on. Here's our deep thought picture. Yeah. It's a funny thing that you would expect them to react this way because their food source for the next year just got wiped out. Like, it wasn't just they got a thunderstorm that day. He says, isn't today the wheat harvest? And he sends hail and rain, which would make the wheat wet. You know, they've harvested, they're putting it out to dry, and that's their food source, their money source for the next year. It rains and hails on it, it's going to be done. Mm -hmm. And then he brings this speech to them. Huh. Like, he got them when they're hungry. They're like thinking, <laughs> the next year's like bumper crop, if you are, any food source. That so he puts them in the wilderness in a way, huh? Gotta have to be dependent on the Lord. Okay, so funny thing is, yes, I'm a weird Christian. Isn't it a wheat harvest today? Okay. No. Well, that's interesting. I'll have to go back and look at that. Where's the reference to the wheat harvest? Is it just above here? 17. Oh, yeah. Wheat harvest? That's a, that's a weird question to ask that day. Like, he's talking, talking, and he's like, a reminder, isn't it? Wheat harvest today? Hmm. Uh, it's like yeah. a sidetracked question, if you think yeah. about it, but not really. Uh, he sends this. Yeah. Brainstorm to ruin the crop. Okay. You know? I'm going to have you to. Would, you wouldn't have reacted that way, would you? You know. Like, no, I like your point. You know. I agree with your point. It's. Really hurt. You know, I would have been. What chapter and verse was that? Well, he's in the chapter 12, verse 17, where we were uh, talking about Samuel's words in charge. He's calling for them to be, you know, faithful and obedient to, to respond to the Lord with the proper yeah, heart. You, but yeah. You just, destroyed your crop. And even, and I'm, you might be onto something because, you know, I've, I mentioned earlier that the whole focus on the fertility gods of the ancient world, like Baal. So if they're depending on other gods for the bumper crop that they hope to have, now this is a call. Well, let me, let me show you who's boss with regards to provision. I'll take out your crops, but if you worship me, you're going to see the bounty and blessing come from other ways and in, in, in miraculous ways, perhaps. So that's interesting. Okay, so this is the deep thought picture. Everybody pause and reflect. Take it all in. There it is. Everybody see it? See it? Anybody want to go out on a limb, Weston? You're perplexed. First, send Muel, of course. Come on. You remember this from, um, and there's Saul. Saul, that's Saul, yeah. For Samuel, and uh, the heart condition. So you, he's the we say the I say at least the no-hearted king. We're going to have the the kings during the United Monarchy. Each will reign for forty years: Saul, David, and Solomon. 
And um, I would argue, as we'll see in the text, each will be evaluated based on the condition or quality of their heart. Not to be too mean to Saul, but just to kind of have it line up equally with David, the wholehearted king, and Solomon, we'll see, will be the half-hearted king. So you've got the full range with these first three kings during the United Kingdom. So Saul is Israel's no-hearted king. And we say that because in contrast, we're going to see that the, the Lord will be seeking a man after his own heart when he finds David. Israel's next king after Saul will be a wholehearted king. So let's move over to chapter 13. After Samuel's addressed, we continue to see skirmishes with the Philistines in 13 chapter 8. We see a little bit of Saul's spiritual heart or his spiritual condition revealed in some of the details of how he handles himself in the situation. So in chapter 13, starting in verse 8, I'll read this one. Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the other people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring to me then the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came about as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, that behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, What have you done? Saul says, well, because I saw the people were scattering for me and uh, that you did not come with the, within the appointed days, that, that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. And therefore I said, now the Philistines come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked for the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. There's a problem here. Um, Samuel says to Saul in verse 13, you've acted foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he had commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. That would have been one path, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded you. Then Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin and saw numbered the people who were present with them, about 600 men. So what we see here in chapter 13 is we see a little bit of a fork in the road again. So now the, the Lord is kind of be redirecting away from Saul, and we're, we've got this focus now on uh, the Lord going to find a man after his own heart. So that's a little bit of a switch there. If you're into military strategy, this will be on the final exam, this chart, in all of its detail. I'm just kidding. Here's the battle plan for the famous battle of Michmash. So Saul's leadership is going to be found lacking in this particular battle. And uh, what Saul does is going to contrast with what we, we saw earlier, for example, in the, the example of, the, of Joshua at Jericho. Let's take a look at 13. Uh, let's pick up in verse 15 and get some of these details here. Let's see. Uh, could I have uh, grace? Could you read for us? Chapter 13, beginning in verse 15 through 23. Then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to the spirit of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Now Saul and his son Jonathan and Of Benjamin, while the Philistines came, and the raiders came from the camp of the Philistines. One company turned toward Ophrah, to the land of Shuang, and another company turned toward Ephraim, and another company turned toward Ophrah, which overlooks the valley of. Now, no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel for the first Otherwise, the Hebrews will make words or spears. So all Israel went down to the first each to sharpen his culture, his mantle, his axe, and his... Okay, so you can just pause there. It's just showing us how, you know, Saul's, you know, over the military operation, but his... A good portion of his soldiers are, are going to the battlefield ill-prepared, 
Uh, and in contrast, over here in chapter 14, look at verse 1 and 2. Uh, we see in contrast, where's Saul, but where's his son Jonathan? So now the day came about when, that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man, man who was carrying his armor, come let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison that is on yonder side, but he did not tell his father. And Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And uh, the people who were there with him were about 600 men. So Saul's under, resting under a pomegranate tree in Gibeah. Remember, that's the tall town or the tall place. In contrast, we find Jonathan and his armor bearer rising to action with correct th theology. In chapter 14, we see that in verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man, man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us cross over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Kind of a echo of uh, Gideon, you know, being his forces being whittled down. And the Lord still brings about the, the military victory. It doesn't matter how many soldiers are on the battlefield even. So, you know, Jonathan, in contrast here to Saul, Jonathan is kind of an anticipation of David. Um, it's not surprising that they're going to become good friends here in a bit and have a lot of spiritual things in common with regards to knowing the Lord. Uh, and it's not going to be long before Saul will be left behind on the battlefield. And we're going to see Saul behind, but yet another one like Jonathan is going to come up. Uh, Israel's true king is going to run out on the battlefield with correct theology, just like we see here in this episode with Jonathan. So we move ahead. Uh, here's the pass at Michmash. It's a nice thin, you know, ravine. And the conflict continues. Jonathan continues with his correct theology, chapter 14, verse 12. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan as armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for Yahweh has given them into the hands of Israel. So what ensues after this is really divine intervention. There's going to be a rout of the Philistines. And like Gideon before, the Lord is going to respond and cause chaos to ensue in the Philistine camp through a very small, minimal army. Verse 15, and there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. Even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it became a great trembling. So divinely uh, in caused. And Saul, finally Saul's going to go to the battlefield with his men, and he's going to join in, in the route that's already in, in, uh, in place. Uh, and already going on in verse 20. Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a great confusion. So already we've got chaos that's going on. And that's conveniently, you know, when we see Saul and his band of soldiers show up to the battlefield. All right, so after battling the Philistines, Saul leads Israel into a situation really of almost constant warfare. And surprisingly, with a high degree of success, we see that in chapter 14, um, verses 47 down through 48. Let's see here. Could I have Jessica? Could you read that for us? Chapter 14, 47 and 48. Um, now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side. Against Moab, the sons of Ammon and Adam, the kings of Soba and the Philistines, and wherever he turned, he inflicted the punishment. And he acted valiantly and defeated the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Okay, so there's always constant warfare. Saul's, in this case, being somewhat successful here. Then we have. Uh, the account in chapter 15 with, uh, with regards to the conflict against the Amalekites. And this is a particular uh, situation that we have where it really demonstrates uh, Saul's acting out of line with the Lord's will in this particular. And, uh, you know, there's, there's long scores to be settled against the Amalekites. So judgment is coming, divine judgment against the Amalekites. And we see Saul and the army of Israel will in this case be the mechanism 
of delivering that judgment against the Amalekites. We see in chapter 15, Samuel says to Saul, verse 1, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. I'll punish Amal Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming uh, up from Egypt. So the charge here is against the, the full execution of judgment against the Amalekites for that early history when they were uh, threatening um, Israel at a very vulnerable time in her history. And uh, Saul's going to be granted victory. We see that in verse 7 down through verse 9. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah, Havilah as far as Shur, which is in uh, east of Egypt. He captured Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive, but, and according to the command, utterly destroyed all the people. The edge of the sword saw the people spared Agag, the best of his sheep, the oxen, fatlings, lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. So this is going to bring about a rebuke from Samuel. And we see that in verse 10 through 11. Samuel steps back in. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, Verse 11, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he's turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning out to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to uh, Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. So here... Uh, Samuel's going to encounter uh, Saul, and uh, Samuel receives his answer uh, with regards to uh, which direction that the Lord's going to go. Let's see, in verse, uh, there's kind of some humor here in terms of verse 13 and, and following. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I've carried out all the command of the Lord, Saul says. But Samuel says, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So he's, you know, literally hearing the disobedience of Saul with regards to his, his being disobedient. All right, so what happens after this in verse 17? And Samuel says, is it not true though you were... Little in your own eyes that you made the head of the tribes of Israel, uh, that you were made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel, and, and the Lord set you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they were exterminated. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Did what was right in your own eyes, another way of saying that. And uh, so we have this focus now on the disobedience. Um, and the verdict uh, is pronounced in verse 22 and 23. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. There's, the, there's where it ends. So the divine verdict. Um, so the Lord's now rejected Saul from being king. Uh, pardon? Oh, okay. Okay, so... Uh, what, Sam, what Saul does not do... It's, uh, Samuel has to do and finish the job with regards to Agag. And we see the details of that down in verses 31 through 35. So Sam Samuel will have to deal with the, the Amalekite king. And that's, you know, the tragic end of this story. Uh, so what we see next is verse, chapter 16 is an important transition. So remember in chapter 15 we see the divine utter rejection of Saul. But notice what we see in verse 1 of chapter 16. Now the Lord says to Samuel, 
How long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, which is the anointing device, and go. I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I've selected a king for myself among his sons. So this is kind of a, are, how many of you are familiar with Lord of the Rings? Of course, you've seen all of them. If you're like, if you're in my household, you've watched them 15, 20, 30 times over and over and over again. They're just so wonderful. We like watching them all the time. My wife does. When she folds laundry, she's watching Lord of the Rings or whatever. When I'm folding laundry, I watch Lord of the Rings. But in the Lord of the Rings, you always see the, uh, it's so masterfully done. When you just think that things have gotten to be totally desperate, right, in the storyline, there's that subtle chord change. You know what I'm talking about? Just that subtle chord change. It's from a minor to a major key, you know, it happens. And you know when you hear the chord change, something's going to happen that's going to be a different direction. I think that's what, if there was music playing behind God's word, we'd hear the chord change right here in chapter 16. Verse 1. So let's, uh, so we re read that. Now, I asked the question. It's interesting. We hear, uh, and ref he, he refers to, I'm going to send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. So we all know that that's a reference to the city of Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Right? That's an interesting question. The Lord specifically sends him to a particular person, Jesse, in the city of Bethlehem. Now, it's good that we see the beginnings here of something good. The Lord is obviously the one who is about and active here. I'm going to go select for myself a king. Now, it's my turn to choose. So that's good. Now, we're in line with uh, Deuteronomy 17. That's prescription number one, right, from Moses. But can we say more? I, I, I kind of like this part. There we go. First Baptist Church of Bethlehem, right there. There's more to be said about Bethlehem. Why would he go to Bethlehem? So at that time, I'll argue this. Bethlehem represents a small town with a big heart. So I'm deliberately talking about Bethlehem in terms of tall, small, and heart for the following reasons. So this will preach, all of you out there. You can use this on Sunday if you want to. <laughs> it was a small town, Bethlehem. Yeah. I think that um, uh, the Lord would come to him and ask uh, saying why he's grieving over Saul not being a king. What's he pronounced judgment on? Has seen the wickedness of Saul's reign. Was he constant military combat, heartless ruler? <laughs> well, obey the Lord's calling. There were. Grieving. Yeah, there was that moment, though, when Samuel, you know, gave his speech, yeah. his address, when there seemed to be indications of him encouraging the people to, you know, with king, people and king together, being in response, right response to the Lord, going down the right path. So he might be a little bit of grieving over that. I mean, in other words, you think he's rejecting him since he's the one that cast the lots to, you know, to a point. What is Samuel grieving over, yeah, right? That's my question. Okay, well, that's a good question. Get rejected by God. Clear yeah, but you, you know, I don't know. I have to think about that. It's a great question. Um, David, David's going to grieve uh, the death of Saul. You know, and look at, I mean, Saul was out. We'll see Saul's going to be out to kill him, you know, eventually. Throwing spears and, you know, David had his chances to even kill Saul, but he doesn't. You know, at the end of his tragic death, Saul and you know, his son, you know, on the battlefield, David's going to write a song of grief over the king. You, you, when a king dies, you grieve, I, I guess, um, at foundation. But there's probably more to be said. So um, I'll, I'll argue, now we're back to Bethlehem, a small town with a big heart. So it's a small town that had a, had a, had a representation of the faithful remnant. That's what I want us to see. And how do we know that, the faithful remnant in Bethlehem? Any, any, anybody want to take a gander? Where did Ruth and Naomi, right? The story of Ruth and Naomi. So, so Naomi's from Bethlehem. And when uh, Ruth and Naomi are desperate, 
desperate situation, having lost all of their husbands and a, a household on the verge of destruction, the household of Elimelech, Naomi's husband, what faithful community shows up to provide for two widows and produces a faithful Boaz who steps in on the scene to enact and knowing his Old Testament, the Leverite marriage law and the kinsman redeemer provision for Naomi. This all comes from a faithful community called Bethlehem. So it's, I'll argue that this faithful community of Bethlehem represents, even in the midst of the dark days of Judges, that 400-year period, somewhere in the midst of all that is the context for the story of Ruth. And everything that goes on in that story, that short four chapters called the book of Ruth, shows off, I would argue, this faithful remnant. This is the community that produces not only Boaz, but now we're meeting up with them again later in history. Now they're, the, now they're producing this boy, David. This boy, David, is going to come from this faithful community as well. This small town during the time of Jesus, when Jesus was born, this is the same town that's going to eventually produce the Messiah. The Messiah will be born here. Um, at the time of Jesus' birth, Bethlehem probably had about a 1,000 people in it. And at the time of the story of Ruth, probably more like three to 600 people, very small. Um, but out of this small town uh, comes the genealogy of the Messiah. First to King David, and then if you read Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy that comes in the Gospel of Matthew, you go from Abraham to David and David to the exile, and then from the exile to the Messiah. There's an intentionality here. So I want to also argue that um, out of this faithful remnant, this is the community that produces King David, the boy King David. Somebody taught the boy David the right theology about God. He grew up in this small community. This is the boy, the small boy, not the tall, but the small boy, David, who knew the right theology about who is going to win the battle today if I run out on that battlefield, right? When he meets up with Goliath, the tall, the small, when the small encounters the tall, David knows his right theology. It's the Lord that's going to win the battle for me today. And we're going to see that uh, just around the corner here when we get to the account with the, the giant uh, named Goliath. My point is, David's learning this theology in this small covenant community in Bethlehem, which not only included his mom and dad, but also the entire community. So I picture in a church like this, and this is an application for all of us pastors and you pastors at home. You're in a small church. You have the potential for producing a King David a change maker could come out of your church because you've got that row in, in, in the front row, the, all those praying grandmothers praying for all the youngins in the church. You know, David had that kind of supportive community. I would argue that, you know, David uh, Samuel goes to Bethlehem to find this King. And the author makes it very clear that here we're not dealing with another first Samuel chapter eight here in uh, chapter 16. Let's look at some of the details of the, of the text here. First uh, Samuel 16. Yeah. Sorry, no, what is the Bethlehem? Yeah. That's where we are here. Mm -hmm. David is David time. The major captain is the Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem. The capital city is Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem. In those days, they saw the Bethlehem is the main city. Mm -hmm. Bethlehem is the main city where yeah. the saw, right? It's one of the major cities, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have Jerusalem will have to be captured by King David later, before it becomes the capital city of the because south. There's no major city. Um, there's a series of major cities, not just one. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see here. So in chapter 16, um, there's one thing that I want to emphasize. Let's look at verse one. So now the Lord uh, says to Samuel, how long will you grieve over? So we read that one. 
For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. There in chapter 16, verse 1. Verse 3, and you shall invite Jesse to, to the sacrifice, and I'll, I'll show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate for you. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, his tallness, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 7, verse 8. But Jesse called uh, Abinadav and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 9, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, The Lord has not chosen these. Finally, we get to verse uh, 12. So he sent and brought him in, David. Now he was ready with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So there's a lot of emphasis there the Lord gives us with regards to just that first, pre, you know, that first statute, the Lord will choose. So this is he. So that's what we have here. And these are points of contrast that we have with 1 Samuel 8. David was chosen by God, and he was chosen because he was, he's going to fit this, this picture of what authentic faith looks like. Uh, and that's what we have in verse 7. And David was not tall. You might think uh, of Saul being tall, you know, that that tallness might, might also overlap into other areas, although they're not as clear in the text. Tall could be self-dependence, pride. You know, not reliant upon the Lord, tall. I am, um, you know, I can pull my, you know, I can get the job done myself. Some of those tendencies that we see in Saul. David is going to be small, but God dependent. And it's all based on his heart. Yeah, did you, Terry, did you have a yes, question? Uh, the word that's um, used for David, good looking. Um, is it the same word that's used for Saul? Chapter 9. Uh, Hebrew, I was and yes, it is. Yep, it's the same. So David's okay to be handsome. He's just not tall, <laughs> and he had beautiful eyes. So he's redneck. Yeah, he's ready. He's got red hair. Or something like that. Kind of like uh, Anne of Green Gables, right? Um, so David did not have a problem with being tall. Remember Saul was a tall man from a tall town from Gibeah. David was a small boy from a small town, but with a big heart. So that's kind of fun to, to talk about that. Um, so we see now a significant contrast now being set up between David and Saul. And uh, in verse 12 and then uh, verse 13. Uh, we see uh, what happens next in terms of the anointing. This is not a huge public ceremony. This is just within the household. Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit, capital S, spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. From that day forward, and Samuel arose and went to Ramah. And um, I'll just draw this picture. You know, what this leads to, if this is, you know, if we took it, look at the two hearts, Saul and David, we're going to, you know, this one's going to be filled in. This is the whole heart, and this is the no heart for Saul. But what this is going to lead now, as the narrative continues, what the author is going to do is give us Saul, you can think of it this way, starts his decline, and eventually he'll, you know, there will be a tragic end to Saul but it just kind of continues to be a downward spiral. But King David, you know, starts small, but he'll eventually get tall with regards to, he'll be authenticated as Israel's wholehearted king. But parallel to David with his rise, we have to, we'll see this in the text. We have to remind ourselves, there's going to be another king who's validated. David, as David is authenticated, we don't lose track of the fact that the Lord is rethroned as king. And we're going to see that with David. As David rises, but warts and all, we're going to see that 
God becomes the true king in Israel. A back, back door to that um, that we don't often think of to validate that, uh, that simple idea is how many psalms do we read about in um, the book of Psalms, we'll get to this eventually, that focus on God as king, right? There's a lot of worship going on during this United Kingdom. Those psalms are being written not just by King David, but other songwriters in the kingdom to celebrate and focus on God as king, God in his kingdom, and God who rules. And it's this worship that's going on in the backdrop of this. Eventually, really more when, you know, really at the end of Saul, when David, you know, is able to rule the king. It's during this time that we're going to probably see a lot of those kinds of psalms being written. And out of David's whole heart, even him as King David will be writing some of those very great hymns of the day. These are psalms that were being sung by the worshiping church of the day, and they celebrate God as king. So that's where it all kind of fits together in my mind anyway. All right. So, ooh, we got to explain this picture. Um, but let's take a break. <laughs> and while we'll we be in suspense, let's take another eight-minute break. And I'll see you on the back, back end.